you for having me. So Hazon is a Jewish environmental organization and the word Hazon is a Hebrew word that means vision. And we were founded uh, with a vision for a healthier and more sustainable world for everybody. And we do that by working with the Jewish community to be more environmentally sustainable with our, with our choices, both as institutions and at the individual level. And so, um, but today I just wanna start with a story. So I go, I'm from originally from Florida and every year I go back to visit my grandma for Thanksgiving and she is 94. And I was, and when we go to visit, she always calls and we have a call. She wants to go grocery shopping and make sure she has all the things she needs for us when we're there so that she can be a wonderful hostess for us. And she says, now, what's that special milk you want me to get again? What's the special milk? And I tell her, so I want, I would like organic milk. And, and then I, I, I said to her grandma, actually, this milk isn't special. This is the milk that you grew up with. And it's the milk probably that you gave to your three daughters, including my mom. But in the 60 years that's gone between now and then, a lot of crazy stuff has been happening to milk. <laughs> We've been filling the cows with uh, hormones. We have been feeding them food that's covered in pesticides. And there's other things that we've been doing. Oh, and we've been pumping those cows up with antibiotics and we're creating antibiotic resistance in people who are having products from those cows. And so I said, um, what I'm trying to get actually is just like normal milk. The milk that in your head, when you think milk, when you think back to your grandma's farm back in Ohio, that's the milk that I want. And it really had me thinking about how much our food system has changed changed in a relatively short period of time. It's changed in our lifetimes, uh, in our parents and our grandparents' lifetimes for sure. And so I'm going to start by sharing a, about a five-minute clip from a film that covers a little bit of the changes that have happened in uh, our animal, industrial animal agriculture system just in the last 60, 70 years. I have it up on the fullest volume I can have it on my side. And so if you need to adjust the volume up or down on your end, please use your own volume control because I'm not able to control that for you. And, and if for some reason that just doesn't work, please just know it's only gonna be five minutes and I'm gonna actually touch on a lot of the points that it covers. So my apologies if for any reason uh, there's any issues with that, but we're gonna hop in. I'm gonna show you about a half minute clip and then fast forward to about a four minute clip. And so uh, please enjoy that with me. Here we go. This is 16 weeks. This is still pattern which I follow today. The Hamburg, ancient old German breed. Here's the king of all the egg chickens, the leghorns. The American Standards of Perfection. You get a copy of the standards, 
And you look at the chicken and you look at the picture. You look at the chicken and you look at the picture until you imprint it in your head, the slight arch of the tail, the height of where the neck is over the head. So when I began to try to bring back standard bred birds, and as I did my work, I thought, I'm going to go back to the original utility farm bird. Well, I grew up on a farm here in Kansas. And my father showed cattle and stuff and did it for a living back then. And as a kid, you know, county fairs to me was just as exciting as Christmas or holidays or anything. And then I started seeing all the chickens. My dad said that all of a sudden I would be gone. They always knew where to find me. I would always be over in the chicken barn. At the age of five, I got my first show chickens. This is where we breed here. The Bard Rock is the oldest American breed that there is. This is the breed that everybody raised in this country by the millions from about 1850 to 1950. The White Jersey Giant was a wonderful breed, extremely slow growing and everything, and that's part of the reason why they lost favor. Other than the 40 or 50 I have here, there's probably not another 20 in the whole world. Everything I'm doing here is nothing new. In fact, this is all very, very old. This is poultry farming 50 years ago. There was this wonderful system of farmers who got together and supported each other to produce the best. That is completely gone today. He tells them the story how in 1923, in the Delmarva Peninsula, a small, almost funny accident happened to an Ocean View housewife named Celia Steele. She had received 500 chicks instead of the 50 she had ordered. Rather than get rid of them, she decided to experiment with keeping the birds indoors through the winter. Confined and lacking sun and exercise, her birds would never have survived were it not for the newly discovered feed supplements. Steele's loop of experimentation continued. In 1923, she had 10,000 birds, and in 1935, 250,000. Ten years after Steele's breakthrough, the Delmarva Peninsula had become the poultry capital of the world. She had perhaps unknowingly given birth to the modern poultry industry and begun the global creep of factory farming. No one fired a pistol to mark the start of the race to the bottom. The earth just tilted and everyone slid into the hole. Okay, so I hope you're able to, to see that. This was this is a film called Eating Animals and it's based on a book by the Jewish author, Jonathan Safran Foer. And you gotta, uh, I just love that line that uh, Frank Reese, the poultry farmer that you saw, he said, you know, I'm not doing anything new here. What I'm doing is all very, very old. But he's being featured in a film because to a certain extent right now, he's being considered cutting edge because virtually nobody is doing what he's doing. Yet what he's doing used to be what everybody did. And as the narrator shared, you know, no one shot a pistol saying, all right, let's go industrial animal agriculture, but we've just slowly changed over decades to a radically different way of raising animals and growing our food and transporting and uh, all packaging and all of that has really changed so much. And I know everybody on this call has experienced this in your lifetimes. And so there's some connections between those changes and um, what we're experiencing in our world right now and right here in Colorado. And so, one thing I'll share is that, um, you know, climate change, I've, I've been doing environmental work and climate work for about 20 years now. 
And to me, climate change was always this thing that was off in the future that we had to stop from coming. And it's really hit me in the last couple of years, it's here. We, we weren't successful actually um, in stopping it from coming. However, we still can be successful in averting the worst of it, that we, now that we are beginning to take very seriously the impacts of climate change, we now can make changes so that it doesn't get as bad as it certainly could get. And that's what I'm here to talk about today. And that's actually really good news. Um, but I will say it really hit me when I realized, oh, wow, it's here. And I wanted to share some of the ways that I realize and know that it's here for me. And I live right up the road from you guys. I'm in Lafayette, Colorado, right outside of Boulder. And the historic average number of days that we have in Colorado that are 90 degrees or more is actually just um, 21. Last year we had 54. I can tell you, I checked this morning, we've had 44 so far this year, and there's five more in just this week's forecast. So, you know, we're on target to hit or pass what we did last year, and we're looking at a two, uh, two, to, two to three times the number of days that are hot. As I mentioned, I grew up in Florida. One of the reasons I moved here was to get away from that heat. So it's kind of bumming me out, but it's not just about hot temperatures. Uh, this is the Calwood fire. Uh, that is a picture from my own driveway. This is, you know, you know, we're getting all that smoke from the wildfires in California, Oregon, and Washington. They're all coming here. But uh, you may remember that last year was the, we had the top three wildfire. We broke the record largest wildfire, broke it again, and then broke it again. We had our three largest wildfires in Colorado history here in Colorado. And that is so much due to the drought conditions that and the heat that are that's being created by climate change. And this is what it looked like from my driveway when the Cowwood fire was burning uh, about 20 miles away in Boulder last fall, less than a year ago. And this is some of the things that we know are going on in the world. This is just from the last few months or last few weeks even. Um, you can see here on the bottom left, that's actually Congregation Bonet Shalom in, uh, in Boulder when we had the 100 year floods back in 2013. Then we've got here pictures of the flooding in uh, Germany, the wildfires in California the hurricane, a huge hurricane that came and hit Guatemala twice. And so this is all the things that we've been told are coming and, and they're here now. And so I take all of this very seriously, but I'm also really excited about all the things that we can do about it. And so going back to what that film was just covering for us. Oh, but before I do that, I actually wanted to invite you all to just share in the chat and we will open up later. I really wanna join you in some conversation and questions and things like that. Um, but right now, just to share, if you wanna introduce yourself in the chat with your name and share one way that climate change has been impacting you um, and or your loved ones uh, in the recent past um, or right now. So feel free to, to share those as I move on in the presentation. So as I mentioned, uh, or as the film mentioned, things have really changed. Factory farms were an invention of the 1960s. As you saw, it kind of started with this accident of a housewife in the Delmarva Peninsula ordered 50 chicks and she got 500 chicks. And from that little experiment, it kept growing and growing and growing and applying to other animals, not just chickens. And now more than 99% of the animals eaten in America were raised on factory farms. And to be clear, that does include kosher um, meat as well. This is kosher and non-kosher meat. And so why does that matter? And you can not look at this slide at all. There's a lot of text here. The dots that I really wanna connect for us is that you hear a lot about carbon dioxide, right? So that's the thing we say like, oh, the fossil fuels, the driving, the carbon dioxide, how we're electrifying our houses. And those are really, that's really important. But what's also important is methane and nitrous oxide. These are the second and third most prevalent greenhouse gases greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. And the important thing to understand about those is 
how much more powerful they are actually at carbon dioxide. So methane, a greenhouse gas, by the way, means it's a gas that keeps the heat in our atmosphere. Methane is 86 times stronger than carbon dioxide at trapping that heat. Nitrous oxide is more than 300 times more powerful than carbon dioxide at trapping that heat. And so when you understand, oh, okay. So if we're serious about getting out of climate change, we can see here this quote on the chart I have, because methane and nitrous oxide are such significantly larger greenhouse gas contributors, expenses because of how much they trap heat so much more strongly, um, in the short term, they're the most urgent to cut. And because they are primarily created by our food choices, they're also easier to cut. Animal agriculture is responsible for 30%, 37% of methane and 65% of nitrous oxide emissions. And a whole bunch of the other methane is actually coming from the food we waste. So our food choices, wasting food and um, industrial animal agriculture are contributing the majority of the methane. And it, you can see here from some of these statistics, as you, we've said, the factory farming started in the 60s and nitrous oxide grew two times faster and methane grew six times faster than any previous 40 year period in the last 2000 years. And I just pulled this information from the, the IPCC report, that's the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. It's the big UN report that just came out a couple of weeks ago. And it found that um, what we have is that the concentrations of methane and nitrous oxide in our atmosphere are higher than they've been in more than 800,000 years. So the, the last dot that I just wanna kind of connect for you here is, okay, so I, I, I get now the connection between methane and nitrous oxide and climate change, but what's, how is that connected to industrial animal agriculture? I hear it's contributing, but how? And the main reason how is that as they're digesting the food, cattle, goats, and sheep produce the methane mostly through belching, through burping, also farting and passed in their waste. Um, and livestock is the leading source, the leading source of methane emissions. And then nitrous oxide is also emitted through the livestock urine, the manure, and the fertilizers used to grow the crop, crops. And livestock is also the leading source of nitrous oxide emissions. So it's coming from the animals and the huge numbers of them and how we're raising them. Another important factor contributing to climate change from the animals that we're eating and from cattle specifically is deforestation. So we have, um, and, and deforestation matters in a couple of different ways. Burning the trees is really contributing to the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, but the absence of those trees, those trees no longer existing. Trees function as carbon sinks. They absorb carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. So it's a double whammy when we uh, cut down these trees and we're thinking that trees are around, and I say by we're thinking, I mean like scientists and experts globally um, estimate that the cutting and burning of these forest is responsible for about 15% of greenhouse gas emissions per year, and 80% of that deforestation occurs to create land for livestock, for their crops, and for grazing. And so those are the connections between the way that we're growing and raising our food and climate change. And going back to the methane, food waste is contributing, it's increased, you know, the point I want to make here is that we talked about how much industrial animal agriculture has changed too. The amount of food we waste is changing. I don't know if you're experiencing it. I certainly know that I've experienced it and my mom and my grandma, they talk about how much food is going to waste compared to how much they used to. And they're just sharing that anecdotally on a personal level. But the EPA has discovered that food waste has increased by 50% since the 1970s. And it's the largest thing going into our landfills now is food waste. And when food is going to the landfill and it's composting um, anaerobically, meaning without any oxygen, and it's in that plastic and buried in the landfills, it's releasing methane. And you'll see here, it says methane is 21 times 
stronger than carbon dioxide. The difference between that number and the other number that I shared being 86 times is the 86 times is how much stronger it is over the next 20 years. But after 20 years, it decreases to only 21 times more powerful. The two points I wanna make about that is 21 times more powerful than carbon dioxide is pretty darn strong still. And also we're continuing to release it. So 21 years from now, there's still going to be, we're still going to be in the first 20 year period of the methane that was released in the last 20 years. So there's no end of like, oh, we, if we stopped all methane today, then we could hit that 21 times powerful number in 21 years, but we're not. And so, um, but this slide already existed. So I have to explain that difference because I wanted to use that graphic. I should probably fix that. Um, but so I just wanted to touch the main reasons why we focus on food and climate at Hazon, and then we're gonna have a little conversation. So as I said, climate change is, is serious, it's real and it's here, but we can do something about it. And we as an organization at Hazon, we feel that Jewish tradition compels us to respond, that we need to take action. And we wanna take action that really makes a difference. We, we wanna be working in an area where the change is really gonna matter. And so we looked into the math and the science of it. And what we found was that reducing the amount of food we waste and getting away from industrial meat and dairy and having really plant-rich diets, these are near the very top of actions needed to reverse climate change. According to an organization called Project Drawdown, which is the preeminent uh, climate action organization, climate research organization. These are in the top four. These, these two items are in the top four things we can be doing out of everything. And so we know it's a big place where we can make change. We also know, moving on to the second bullet, that we can't reverse uh, climate change without changing how we eat. The math is such that if we did everything else, we stopped, let's say we stopped flying, we have all electric vehicles, we only bought used clothes and we did everything else, it still wouldn't be enough. There is such a contribution from industrial animal agriculture and food waste that if we don't change those two things, it's not gonna be enough to bring uh, the warming that we're doing to our planet down to the level we need to keep things from getting worse. And so as it says here, and this is a quote from Jonathan Safran Foer, changing how we eat will not be enough on its own to save the planet, but we cannot save the planet without changing how we eat. Another reason this is a primary uh, activity for us at Hazon is that food is central to Jewish life and tradition. As a Jewish community, we've been thinking about what's kosher, what's fit to eat for nearly 3000 years. It comes very natural to us as a people to make our food choices seriously, to consider their impact and to, to limit our choices, to be creative with the, with the things that are available to us. And so, so it's a really natural spot for us to be in. Also, it's really great to work on reducing how much food you waste and work on eating plant-rich diets because they address more things than just climate change. They address hunger, personal health, animal welfare. And so, you know, you've really got good solutions that they're fixing more than just one problem. And then the final reason that we really work on food and climate at Hazon is that it's um, something that can be done right away. We, everybody on this call can change your behavior on these things today at the very next meal you eat. You don't need special knowledge or training. It's something you can do incrementally. You don't have to suddenly never throw away food again. You don't have to become a vegan and never have meat or dairy ever again. Um, you can have less. You can work towards increasingly less. Um, so it's, it's not an all or nothing change that would feel impossible to make. Um, it's, uh, generally also cost neutral. And it even usually saves money to be uh, wasting less food and eating more plant-rich diets and getting away from industrial meat and dairy. And so that's why we focus on these. And so I wanted to open this up for a little bit of discussion with you guys, if you'll join me in that. You know, um, as it's said in the film, um, you know, or as uh, as Fr Farmer Frank Reese said, you know, I'm not doing anything new. What I'm doing is all very, very old. And Jonathan Safran Foer wrote the book Eating Animals that that film was based on. He also wrote this book called We Are the Weather, Saving the Planet Begins at Breakfast. 
And a point he made in that book was, we don't need to reinvent food, but to uninvent food. The future of farming and eating needs to resemble the past. And so that's the kind of conversation I'd like to actually open it up for a little bit here is what would it look like to resemble the past? What aspects of farming and food systems do you think need to be uninvented? What growing and eating practices of your parents, your grandparents' time, and even from early in your own lives, do you think that we should be trying to be like today? When I think back to my grandparents in New York, um, you had all your different vendors. You didn't have the large supermarkets, you know, so they shopped fresh vegetables, but, you know, um, everything was kind of on a daily basis uh, and you used what you needed. Um, and I think that made a difference as well. Mm. Thank you, Rebecca. I, I have a, I have a, what I think works best today is everybody getting those organic, um, like the green barrel that everybody can get from Denver um, waste, because that way you can put all that um, composting fruit or food in there, and then it gets picked up every week and it gets sent to the farm where the worms get to eat it. And I think that's a really big way to, to stop all this uh, carbon carbon that's going that's just heating our planet thank you i think also the next generation my kids are so environmentally conscious they have actually been my teachers mm -hmm. on on shifting um dietary things and everyday usage and i um, mean it's an education because i really I think that while my grandparents and my parents enjoyed some of the more original, um, you know, they didn't use the word organic back then, but it, that's really how they lived and worked. Um, and they did compost, even though they didn't call it that. <laughs> just right. Yeah, there were just more natural things. And, and now we have to be more conscious and we have to really work at undoing the manufactured aspect of, of being consumers. I think about when the language is organic and conventional, like if you go buy an organic apple or a conventional apple, and I'm like, how'd that get flipped on its head? It's the organic apple that was the conventional way of doing things. And we it's just gotten completely, completely flipped. I, I just think that we went through a time, or I know I did, but I don't anymore. We used to buy so many already prepared things. And then you take them home and you have all those packaging, all that, and that's got to contribute everything, all that cellophane wrap and all that, even the boxes, like, I feel good because I recycle all the boxes, but still, I mean, it's so much waste. It's so much waste. And um, if we could just go back to, I don't know, people work and they need to, I guess, get prepared foods and things, but still, then they're so processed and um, filled with, um, preservatives and all that. So I don't know, I was just trying to think yeah. of things. Thank you. I know my, and my grandparents would never think to go and buy ready-made chickens and they, you, they would make the, I mean, whoever, I mean, I can remember the chicken running around the house, you know, I mean, it would never be like it is now. I, I just run to the store to get a book, to get it. I'm feeling guilty here, yeah. <laughs> Well, and one of the things that you um, raise that I'll make a point on is we, um, you may have heard the terms reduce, reuse, recycle. And the idea is actually to try and reduce first, then try and reuse, and then try and recycle, and recycle being the last. And uh, another reason that I didn't actually get into too much with why food waste is such a big deal, part of it is the methane that is leached out of it when it goes into the landfill but we're actually wasting about, in the United States, about 40% of the food that we grow and, has, and we're wasting everything that we put into it. So the tens of thousands of Olympic size swimming pools worth of water, the hundreds of hundred thousands of acres of, of land that we've taken to be not wildlife habitat anymore, but to grow food on, the amount of fertilizer that we're putting in, the harvesting, all the packaging that you just mentioned, and we do all those things and then we just throw it away. So we're throwing away, not just the food, 
But all those inputs all along the way that went to create that food is also going out, but that's invisible to us. And I think that's actually one of the biggest changes that have happened. Back in, in it, I just saw this in a movie I watched yesterday in, in around 1900, about 50% of the American population was involved in farming. And now it's about 1% at most. And it is indeed invisible to us we really literally don't know and literally don't see how the cows are raised, how, what it took to have those strawberries get grown, get packaged and make it from wherever they were to your refrigerator. It's literally invisible to us. And one of the things that we can uninvent is making it visible again, us learning and understanding. And that doesn't necessarily mean we all become farmers again, but just having the information having more farms that are local, having gardens, like, I don't know if it's still there, but I know you guys have wonderful gardens there at Kavod that Hazon has been part of supporting and with Ikar Farm doing some wonderful programming. And those are the kind of things that can uninvisible this. So that'd be one of the changes I'd love to see um, to make things um, more uninventing and more resembling the past. I know I've tried to support more um, like farmers markets as opposed to going to the supermarket for the same thing so that there's so many seems to be many farmers in Colorado and if you go to the farmers markets on the weekend you could just support them get yeah. good quality and then not put it into big corporations and they don't come wrapped so you're not in a package you know you buy everything loose you put it in a bag yeah, yeah. Yeah, and another statistic that I heard, this would not be another thing if I could if I could make the world be the way I wanted it to. Um, it used to be something about 86 cents of every dollar went to the farmer um, for the food they grow. And now it's about 15, one five cents. So when you shop at the farmer's market, you are getting a lot more of that dollar into the hands of the farmer. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's a great thing to be doing. I have a question. Yeah, absolutely. What is your research and opinion around plant-based meat, like Beyond Meat, which is a manufactured processed product? Great. Any other questions? And I can do two or three at once. Ken wrote a comment in, yeah. the, in the chat. It says, my parents had no food waste. What did not get eaten was either was used to slop the hogs or feed, treat the chickens. Yeah. So um, Marilyn, I'm gonna answer your question by weaving it into the next part of my presentation. So I'm gonna put a little pin in it for the moment and, um, and Ken, I'll address your comment and then we'll, we'll move forward. Um, the, there's something called the food recovery hierarchy. And it's the idea that what are the order that we should be addressing food waste? And the number one thing we should be doing is reducing how much of it we have in the first place. So that literally means that we don't buy food that we end up not eating and then throwing away, throwing it away, that we don't order more that we need, um, that we change things in our system. Like we have labeling that tells you that when, when things expire and um, or our best buy and sell buy. And those have nothing to do with when food isn't good to eat anymore. And so if we could change the labeling on those so people would realize that this can still be tasty, nutritious and safe to eat. Uh, so there's a lot of things we can do there. The next thing on the list is to feed people with that food. And I've been involved with some really great programs in the Jewish community and beyond where excess food from like weddings and bar mitzvahs and uh, corporate luncheons are given to people who need food. Uh, the next thing after that is feeding animals. That's the very next best thing that you can be doing is um, pigs, chickens, getting that food out there. Um, and then after that, it's um, actually like biogas. And then after that, compost and then landfill. So compost is really great, but it's actually kind of, you know, it's way better than landfill, way, to be very clear, way, way, way better than landfill. But there's so many other things that we could be doing before we compost. And you're absolutely right. Getting it to the animals is is would be another thing that I would, you know, throw back, uh, uninvent our food system and be getting our, making less food waste and the food waste that we do have, making sure people and animals are eating it. So I'm gonna actually go back to my slideshow and uh, move on to the next part of my presentation and get into um, the question that was just raised and more. So um, one thing I really just wanna jump to is, 
understanding that, you know, I have the privilege of doing this work within the Jewish community. So I get to say, you know, Jewish tradition truly does compel us to respond. Like that's just not a line that Hazon uses as an environmental organization. We are taught by our tradition that we are not free. Here, Rabbi Tarfon taught, we are, it's not our job to do all the work. I single-handedly, even all of us, if all of us got on this call got together, we're not gonna be able to reverse climate change, right? We can't do that, but we can absolutely be doing our part and we are not at liberty to neglect our part. And so I feel that, um, I feel that Jewish responsibility, that obligation, and that's a lot of what drives my work. And there's a woman named uh, Doris Haddock. She went by the nickname Granny D. She was a very well-known activist. She died in her 90s a few years ago, and she walked across the country in her 80s. I'm telling you, she walked across the United States, not even from, I can't even imagine walking from Lafayette to Cavote, right? But this woman in her 80s walked across the United States to raise awareness about the issues she cared about. And I just love this quote so much. Aren't we privileged to live in a time when everything is at stake and when our efforts make a difference? Oh, be joyful that you're a warrior in this great time. And I hold that so dear because it's it can feel really like overwhelming and negative. And then I go, oh my gosh, I have so much power and that's good news. That doesn't need to be something that I shirk away from or feel burdened by. It's actually something that I can embrace. Like I wanna make a difference in the world and that I'm alive in a time where my choices make such a difference is actually pretty exciting and rewarding. And I hope you feel that way too. And, and to say, um, this is from Nigel Savage, this last quote here, you know, we've learned from a lot of different Jewish traditions, whether it's keeping Shabbat or keeping kosher, that when we limit our choices, it doesn't diminish our happiness, it increases it. We don't think about Shabbat and say, oh, that's the time where you're not allowed to drive and you can't write and you're not supposed to spend money and it's such a drudgery. We are joyous that Shabbat is here. This is a time to focus on what really matters to us, to get creative with what we can do with our time and to learn and to rest. And, you know, I'll show you, like, this is what it looks like to eat a plant-rich diet. I, this doesn't look like suffering to me. This doesn't look, the, you, we can turn a climate crisis into a climate opportunity. The people I know who are experimenting with getting away from industrial meat and dairy, many of them are sharing, I am eating more deliciously and more healthily than I ever have, and I'm really enjoying it. So, um that's what's really um, exciting here. And so I just wanna tell you about a program that we have at Hazon, and this is where I'm gonna address the Maryland's question, is that uh, it's called the Breed, the Breed Hazon. And you can sign up at this website that's right here. And when I stop sharing my screen, I'll add it to our chat as well. And what you are saying is that, I, I, don't, I don't know what I wanna do, but I wanna do something. I want to make a difference. I wish so many people are like, just tell me what to do. Well, here's what you can do. We give you six choices to commit from, and you can transition, commit to experimenting with a plant-rich diet, reducing household waste, reducing your food waste, buying less stuff, reducing, oops, sorry, reducing your energy use, or you can also experiment with get growing and buying local, like going to the farmer's market and having a garden that someone shared. And so this is a six week commitment. You sign up and say for the next six weeks, I want to do this thing and I'm gonna to commit to it. And then when you say, okay, the thing I wanna experiment with is reducing my food waste, for example. You're gonna click there and um, I'm gonna show you what it looks like here. Um, this is our website here. It's the Breed has the hazon.org slash Breed Action. And it takes you here. And let's say I wanna reduce my food waste. I click here and then we are here six ways you can do it. And we give you six actions and you can open up and read about each of these actions. Compost is one. We talk about learning how to freeze food. We talk about how to ignore the sell by best by dates. And you just sign up and you say, I'm gonna, you know what, I'm gonna do that. I'm curious about this, um, trust my senses and stop relying on the date and, trust the how things smell and how they look. That's what I'm gonna use. And I'm gonna stop throwing food out just cause the date on the container. And so that would be the action you commit to. You can do one, two or three actions and you just fill this out. And um, 
and away you go. And so um, under the plant-rich diets one, I wanted to just share was that um, one of those options is to experiment with subbing out one item that you normally have with a plant-based version. And so you could pick milk, you could pick butter, you could pick chicken, you could pick beef, whatever thing that, and you're saying for six weeks, I'm gonna experiment and only have the, a plant-based version of that. And so for you, if that's beef and you're saying, okay, I'm gonna experiment with beef, you could also just not have beef, um, but you could also experiment with those substitutes. So it's called swap it is what we called that action. So you're gonna swap out that one item for a plant-based version. And so um, to, to answer the question about plant-based meats, there are so many things happening in the world around um, meat and meat substitutes. And there's a variety of things happening. And the three main categories I would say is things that are not really trying to be meat. So you can get a lot of veggie burgers out there that are, you know, they're grains and quinoa and vegetables, and they're not trying to pretend to be a hamburger, you know, but it's still a, a patty that you can put in a sandwich and treat like a hamburger and still enjoy and have be very delicious, but it's not trying to pretend to be a hamburger. Um, and then there are a second category, I would say, are these ones that are um, like Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger, um, some of the early versions like Boca Burger, where they really are trying to imitate meat, that you're eating it and you are getting a sense of, um, of the texture and flavor and smell of actual meat. The third category is actually like cell-based meats. This is meat that's actually meat, but it's being reproduced from a single cell and being um, grown in a production facility. And so it's not being, and this is very new technology. Like it's not a thing you can, like people like schmucks like us can get. Um, <laughs> but um, apparently actually the very first restaurant serving this lab meat is in Israel. And, um, and so it's going to be coming steadily available in the next, I'd say three, three plus years is when it will start becoming like actually a thing that you could acquire. Um, but um, going to the one that you were raising about Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger, there it is unquestionable that they are significantly better in terms of environmental impact. It is, it is very clear in terms of land use, in terms of water use, um, in terms of um, greenhouse gas emissions, significantly, significantly better. Um, I, I, if I had it queued up, the documentary that I just watched yesterday actually got into this exact thing and they were actually interviewing several of the people at these companies. So environmentally, significantly better. Um, uh, in terms of like calorie and health, it's product by product and person by person. Um, you could say something's healthier because it has fewer calories, but calories aren't necessarily a marker of something being healthy or not. Um, but if you're overweight and trying to have less calories, then something having less calories could be more healthy for you. Um, and so that, that's one consideration. Um, there's, it's, it is definitely true that these are heavily processed foods. Um, so it's not a whole food. So if you were to have a, a, a patty that's made with like beans and roasted beets and, and things like that, you're really eating things that like kind of came to, from the ground and, you know, they got chopped up with spices or whatever, but like the ingredients are like identifiable. Um, and Impossible Burger, Beyond Burger, those kind of products are, are, are very heavily processed. They're not ingredients that you would recognize, that your parents would recognize um, a lot of them, some, some of the ingredients are. And so a lot of people really are down on them for those reasons. Um, but really I would say what you need to be monitoring for your own personal health and what you're consuming, um, I would say it's a case by case call. Um, there's certainly not anything that's come out that said like, oh, this is really gross and horrible for people. Um, and so, yeah, so that's, that's I hope that addressed, addressed your addressed your question. And, um, and certainly the plant-based meats, um, this is probably goes obvious without saying, is way better for animals who are no longer being factory farmed. Um, and so it's better for the environment. It's certainly better for animals. 
to have um, those. And so that um, uh, actually was all that I really had to share. I wanted to go through all that. So I wanted to definitely leave a few, a little time now at the end for any other questions or comments that are coming up. I'm, I'm just wondering, are other countries, are people in other countries as wasteful as us? And like, I was thinking of my trips in the past to France where we'd go to the market and just buy the day's produce and everything from nuts to, to vegetables, to everything for that day. So to me, that seems so much better. Not that I could picture us doing that here. People will, you know, but are they as wasteful all around? Or is it just, I mean, just globally, the developed? Globally, yes, yes. Unfortunately, the answer is yes. Globally, a third of the food produced is wasted. That's the global average is a third. We're, we're a little bit worse in the United States. States, but globally, the average is a third. But what varies quite a bit from country to country is where the food waste is coming from. And so in some countries, it's more an issue of um, there being food waste on the, at the farm level. And um, in the United States, the single largest sector of food waste, which is 44%, is coming from residential. And again, it's invisible to us because you're thinking like, oh, I'm only throwing out this much. But guess how many millions of people are actually also doing that? And so um, the 44% of food waste is coming here. The next, um, the next level of food waste is restaurants. And a whole bunch of that food waste is actually post-consumer. So it's not happening on the kitchen end. It's happening when they clear our plates. It's the food that we didn't eat that we overordered or decided we didn't like that we didn't take home as leftovers. And so more than half of the food waste um, is happening at the restaurant and home level. So it's the individual consumer where that waste is happening in other countries, the food, the breakdown of where the food waste is happening and what percentage of the food waste problem is happening in households versus restaurants or grocery stores or distribution centers or on the farm. Um, or production facilities and things like that varies quite a bit. But generally it's the, 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 company, the countries that have populations with disposable income, we are indeed disposing of it. <laughs> yeah. I was just gonna add Becky, you know, it also, I wonder how much, you know, our portion sizes has grown exponentially over the years, you know, and then we talk about the waste that we have as individuals and restaurants portion sizes have gotten out of control, you know, and if we actually start realizing what our bodies need and how to process it without, you know, over consuming, um, you know, we're fed, you know, societally, you know, more is better, you know, so there's a shift that needs to happen. And, um, you know, that's one thing, you know, so I want to share just one thing I do. Um, I once owned a pet supply store and certainly sold my share of dog food and cat food, which I think is highly processed. Um, but I also, you know, way back when you, when you asked that first question about what has changed, food scraps went to, as we talked, the hogs and the animals and the, and the dogs and the cats, and, they, you know, it was utilized in that way. Um, and so I take that philosophy um, when I have an overabundance in my own little vegetable garden beds, I chop those up finely and I, I make a vegetable mash for my dogs and I freeze it, you know, so that I have it. Um, and, you know, and so that's, that's one way that I try to maximize the use of, of my food that I grow and, and, and share it too with neighbors and friends. But, um, but it is one thing that I do is uh, freeze, freeze food for my dog, um, especially all the vegetables that um, are healthier in, you know, coming from my garden. Thank you. Can I just ask you thing? Because there is one thing I'm a little concerned about that you said about not paying attention to expiration dates. Because maybe about 10, 12 years ago, my husband had a bad case of food poisoning and he was hospitalized for a week, five days. And I'm like, I, when I, especially with dairy, if I see that date, I, I just, I'm afraid to eat it. And, and you're saying it's, it is okay if you smell it milk i know milk will curdle but other things i don't know if i could would trust anything i mean what do you think i mean if it's if it's processed doesn't it have a longer life than if it's organic because then organic has no preserve you know I right don't. right 
Well, what it comes down to is that the same way that we've kind of disconnected where our food comes from, we kind of have disconnected from our senses and really trusting. And some of us never maybe even having learned what how food is is when it's not good anymore. And so that has broken down. And I don't have these off the tip of my tongue, but actually if you were to sign up to the reduced food waste and you could pick the, um, the there's the action there of stop, uh, of trust your senses. And we link there a bunch of resources that tell you like, here's how you can tell with, if this is bad or that is bad. Um, and the thing to just say is I've had stuff that's gone bad that wasn't at the expiration date yet. Yeah. And, you know, and I certainly didn't do the reverse and say, oh, well, it says it's good for another two weeks, even though it's blue and fuzzy, yeah. I'm going to still eat it because it's not that date yet. You know, like, like, you know, we, we can, we can know. And, um, and so the only thing that's regulated, um, that it truly means this is expired is baby food, baby food. Mm -hmm is the only thing and formula actually, I was gonna say baby food, it's actually, I think even just formula is the only thing that like you should really take seriously. Um, the rest is truly not legislated. It so, is, a lot of it is communication to the manufacturer. A lot of it has to do with people will buy this more if we make sure that it's marked a little bit sooner than, and it'll say freshest buy, best buy. The other things to, you know, all these, we, we give one tip, but you can often act in complimentary with other things. So like, oh, this milk is going to go off in a couple of days, probably. So I'm going to go ahead and throw it in a blender with some fruit and throw it in the freezer. And now I've got smoothies and I've now just, you know, I'm not going to drink it in the next two days. We're leaving town or whatever it is, but there's still a way that I can use this from going down the drain. Um, but specifically, you know, better safe than sorry for sure but we've trained ourselves on where we the, to not even question the dates and um and in fact most food poisoning has to do with like salmonella and things like that that have nothing to do with food and food expiring yeah. but food actually just being in, in, infected and toxic um yeah. and not and not related to that but you know we are certainly not suggesting anybody eat anything that's not well for them but there are, there are organizations and resources that tell you, here's how to know if an egg is bad. Here's how to know if bread is bad, cheese, et cetera. Um, and everybody has their own comfort level. And the thing that, I, the, the beautiful thing, and I'll end on this note, because I know we need to end, is that um, we don't have to do it all. So if that's an area where you're just not comfortable or someone's not comfortable with like, yeah, I just don't want to mess with that. Great. You've got about a hundred other things that you could be doing and you don't have to worry about that. That's okay. None of us have to do it all. Find the area where you can do something that you feel comfortable with, that you want to enjoy experimenting with. that doesn't feel like oh, a little sketchy outside of my comfort zone because there's many things that are, and then you can push yourself and push yourself a little bit. And um, that's, I've just been making little incremental changes year after year after year. And then you end up with like a whole different way of eating and a whole different life. And it's like easy and delicious and, and nutritious and safe. And, and so, you know, if, if, if that, if reducing, you want to reduce food waste, but you don't want to mess with the label thing, we have five other actions you could pick. You can also just not pick reduce food waste and pick one of the other actions. What we really want to do is just say, um, we are compelled by Jewish tradition to respond to the climate crisis, and we know choices around our food are among the highest impact ones. And I invite you to play around with um, and em embrace that warrior that Granny D taught us to embrace um, and make some change. <laughs>